Matthew chapter 9. And he entered into the ship. Now we left, left off in chapter 8. And in chapter 8, he's visited the, uh, the Gadarenes. He heals or, or takes care of the, the devils and the two men, cleans them up. Pot belly market has fallen. The pigs are dead. And the people say, get out of here. So he entered the ship. And when we get to Mark and Luke, you'll see it's instant. You got to be forewarned. Outside the long suffering of God, that if you tell God, get out of here, leave me alone, He will. Now He's long suffering and merciful, but later on in, in the Gospels, when we talk about Jesus walking on the water, the Bible says He would have passed right by Him. Had they not invited him. On the road to the Emmanuel, When they come to the house. Or the place to stay. It says he, he would have kept on going. They're like well, wait a minute. Why don't you come join us. Sometimes God will keep going. Unless you ask him. And then when you tell God. Who is Jesus. Jesus is God. You leave me alone. He may. He may do exactly what you tell him to do. And it may not be exactly what's good for you. People may say, well, give me a religion. Give me a church to my liking, to my belief. The guy says, okay, fine. To all kinds of denominations and no denominations. You say, why are there so many churches? Because that's what the people want. God said, I'll give it to you. Until the time that you are going to interrupt his word, they were going to build that tower. And had and God said they had the capability, they had the, 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 the will. God said, I'm going to come down and I've got to stop that. God allows Lucifer to do all he does. Again, you can't, well, I don't believe in free will. What are you going to do? And behold, as he passed over and came to his own city, Nazareth, where he shall be called a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. Remember, we went through that one. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, the second palsy, lying in a bed. So this palsy, the last palsy we read about, it was in torments of pain. This one, you would assume he can't get out of bed. And you've seen some palsy people where they can't get out of a wheelchair. They can't do nothing for themselves. Because of the disease. This man is lying in bed helpless. They brought the man. And Jesus seen their faith. Not only the one that's sick, but the men that brought him. <clears throat> The man that's sick of post can say, listen, I hear about this Jesus. Br bring me to this Jesus. I can't go. I can't walk. And, and the man can say, oh, come on, man. That, that, that guy's a phony. That's... And I, yeah, you know what? He can. And Jesus seen their faith, not his faith. Don't mess with the pronouns like what the world wants you to do. 
said unto the sick of palsy, Son, and later the Gospels will say, Man, Son, relate that this guy is Jewish. You know what widespread condition of Israel is when Jesus shows up? It is a sick, devil-possessed, God-rejecting Pharisees holier than thou condition. And if the law was not bad enough, and I mean the law is strict, that's what I mean. The Pharisees added to it, you know, except the man wash his hands. Well, come on, man, you got enough laws. And I mean you have to bring a yardstick or a measuring stick. We were gonna go for a walk on the Sabbath. Son, being Jewish. Be of good cheer. Oh, really? I'm sick in bed. I can't do nothing. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, the main root cause of all ailments is sin. But it does not have to be your sin. It does not have to be your parents. Listen, you you could go out for a drive, go home, go to church, something like that, and a drunk driver smack you and you'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. That wasn't your sin. That wasn't your pastor's sin to say, we're going to have church today. That would be the sins of the person that got drunk. Or you could have been born with an ailment, and that will come up, I believe, John, and the rabbi said it was because of the sins of your parents. Somewhere, somehow, there was a sin that your parents did. This is why you... No! But there is a sin that goes back to your great, 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 run back to Luke chapter 3, Grandpa and Grandma, Adam and Eve. Now, see, when a psychiatrist, and I know somebody... Psychiatrist said, you know, your mother, your mother was the problem. Well, you didn't go far enough back to mother. Because you need to go to grandma, grandma, great, 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 great grandma, mom, mom, and E. Ailments could be, he says, thy sins be free. So we're, take the assumption that this guy sinned. But usually palsy, you are born. With this disease, I, I assume. I don't know much about it, but pretty much you're born with it. And if that's the condition, he's talking about this man being sin in general. Diseases could be caused by hey, the nature of man of Adam. You're a sinner. It could be your parents, it could be your grandparents. It could be the devil. It could be God. It could be you. Do you realize 42 chapters in the book of Job? Job had an ailment. You give me a chapter and verse in Job and not tradition. You give me a chapter and verse in Job, and who said it? Where the revelations of Job was, that was Satan that did that. And God gave it. No, I'm not talking about Job 1 and 2. Yes, I know that. Where Job himself learned. Or his three friends, or Elihu. And people will say, well, when you get to heaven, it'll be all revealed. Well, listen, when I get to heaven, if I've had a painful ailment, like some of these people in the Bible, some people in life, I don't want to be reminded of it. Just, hey, listen, great peace, no more pain, no more suffering. I'll be happy with that. 
And behold, certain of the scribes, they're in charge of the scriptures. You will have problems with the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. The religious folk. You know, one of the biggest problems I have with my ministry and my convictions of who and where I stand? The pastors. The piano players. The preachers, the Sunday school teachers, the elders of the church. Because how could how could you tell me I come from elite college? <laughs> My piece of paper is better than your piece of paper. <laughs> and to that I would say. <clears throat> Behold, a certain of the scribes said within themselves. They don't say it out loud. I mean, you ever, you ever talk to yourself and no one's heard you ever say something to yourself? I mean, you, you're somewhere. We like to, Joe, will you stand up and take applause for everybody in the room and all that? You know, you're, Joe's an idiot. I did the work that Joe did. I worked harder than what Joe did. I mean, you ever had those moments? No one's heard you. This man blasphemy. Jesus. These are the unpardonable sins. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, you couldn't get away. In other words, you know what? We're going to have a surprise party for, for God. You're not going to fool him. You're not going to surprise him. You're, you, you, can't, you can't walk up to God and say, God, guess what? You can't walk up to the Holy Trinity and say, I know something you don't know. <laughs> Jesus knowing their thoughts. That's scary because you know what? God knows your thoughts. See, but to see the world puts it to Santa Claus. He knows when you're asleep. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been good or bad. So be good for the rest of the year. You better watch out. You better not. But I'll tell you why. Jesus Christ is coming to town. He don't come through the chimney. Though he's described as a thief. Oh, the Baptist church loves Santa. No bow down before Jesus' feet. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, uh, He's going to speak out loud. Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? <laughs> You imagine the prick in their heart on that one? Oh. How do you know that? How did Rebecca know that Esau had planned in his heart that he's going to slay Jacob? And it must have been a really right intention. I mean, right that he was going to do it, not it was right or wrong. That his intentions were he was going to kill his brother because the Holy Spirit had to warn Rebecca. And you got to realize everybody saved or lost has got to realize God knows what we're thinking and we will be judged as well as what we think as with what we do and say. Whoso looking upon a woman to lust after her in his heart. You guys just think about it. Imagine that either judgment when the axe fall. I mean, Jesus, I didn't do it, but you thought it. And the biggest thing, people, well, I didn't kill anybody. Have you ever said drop dead? I wish you died. I gonna get even. Have you ever said that? That's just as guilty as doing it. 
What separates God from all gods is God knows what you're thinking. How do you know that Jesus is God? Because each and every time he knows what they said in their heart. Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, not your head. I hear voices in my head. It ain't voices in your head, it's voices in your heart. For whether is it easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, which man cannot say, or to say, Arise and walk? Man can't say that either. What do you want me to say to this man? Because Jesus could say both. Jesus could say, all right, get up and walk. And he would have got up and walked. And I'm going to place the assumption. And I could be wrong, but for Jesus to say, thy sins be forgiven me. There is a sin issue. But it's always a sin issue because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I believe that Jesus said, Thy sins are forgiven thee because he knew already, because he knows already what they are going to think before they even thought what they were going to think. That's what makes Jesus God number two. Not only does he know what you think, but he knows what you're going to think before you even think it. You cannot deceive God. So, you go to that altar call <clears throat> because you know your pastor's not going to send anybody home until somebody goes up to that altar call. God already knows your heart is wrong. Never mind the deceivability of what your pastor of the church is teaching. 430 seconds. Just as I. You know? Whether false or true, God, Jesus, knows. But that ye may know the Son of Man. Of Mary, the adopted son of Joseph, human, who on the boat was asleep, who hungered. Back in Matthew 4. Has the power on earth to forgive sin? And he has not died. And he's not been buried. And he's not been risen from the dead yet. So what happens to a person they come to Jesus and he's in his earthly ministry. Jesus forgive me for I have sinned. Whatever it is. That man lives past the gospel. And I mean, lives past. Jesus has suffered and died, was buried, rose again. He's ascended up to heaven. What happens to that man who dies later? Now, Jesus forgave him sins. But what happens to him if he doesn't trust in the blood atonement of Jesus? What do you do with that dispensation? What if after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus says, every, and he keeps bringing the offering to the temple to 70 AD, when the temple is completely destroyed? And he's heard Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul 
personally out of their mouths preaching Jesus. What do you do with that? Jesus said he has the power on earth to forgive sins. He had not died, he had not been buried, and he had not been risen from the dead. Then says he to the sick of Palsy, Arise, take up thy bed. He's still laid in the bed. Go unto thy house. Now wait a minute. He says in verse 2, Son, be of good cheer. Thy, sin, thy sins be forgiven. He's interrupted by the thoughts of the scribes. Verse 5 is, thy sins forgiven thee, arise and walk. He never got the chance to say arise and walk. He's been interrupted. This man's now lying in the bed still. Okay, my sins are forgiven. What? I'm still in bed. You and me have come on this side of Calvary. You may have come and put your faith and trust in Jesus. And you are saved. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you may not be cured of your disease. Your ailment. I told, I, when I was in the prison ministry, I said, you chop off your arm before you got saved. And then you get saved. Don't expect to watch your arm grow back. It's not going to happen. But Jesus then could turn around then, some ailment, he could say, all right, arise, take up your bed, you're healed. He could. He could, after you go into the doctor, the doctor says it's cancer, terminal cancer. And you could go to church because you know how you can, God's got your attention. And you go to church, or your your, your co-worker witnesses to you, or your somebody opens a Bible with you, and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are saved. And eventually, that doctor will run more tests, and I I, I can't believe it. It's gone. I've known that to happen. Or, you got terminal cancer, and you go, somebody witness to you, and you get saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved as much as anybody is saved, your name is Lance Book of Life, doctor runs tests, you go back to his office, and he says, I can't believe this, that cancer is spread quicker than I ever expected it. Chemo's not even going to give you no more time. Uh, radiation. It has just blown out of proportion in your body. But I'm saved. Jesus saved me. And it... You could get saved and your spouse could come up to you. I still want that divorce. Or you could be saved, get saved, get on fire for the Lord, want to do right, and, and you wanting to do right because you were not, you and your spouse did not get married, saved. You got saved after you were married. And I don't want to walk like that. I don't want to live with somebody like that. And it's happened. Salvation does not do a cure all as your modern ministry and, and your, uh, I'm trying to get a word. Name it, claim it. Prosperity gospel. That's what I'm trying to think of. 
That man is still in his bed and Jesus says, listen, I forgive you. He's still got the palsy. And those men would pick him up, brought him home. So the mercy of God is take up thy bed, go to thy house. Man gets out of bed, he's carrying his bed home. And he arose and departed to his house. All right, he's been healed. One hundred percent of all your healing will be when you get to heaven and after you died or rest. I knew a man who, who was lame in his feet because of the war, and I was an early Christian. He told me all the time. He goes, "Oh, he goes, Stanley." One day I'm going to be running and jumping in heaven. I look at him like, yeah, okay, I was a new Christian. I didn't know nothing. I'm like, Brother Tony, <laughs> okay, whatever you say. You're not going to say to Brother Tony, I've got legs, I can't feel nothing no more, and they're just too but You and I are going to be running and jumping together in heaven. You know, my legs could be because I didn't believe Tony. It may not be diabetes. I mean, I didn't mock Brother Tony. I, I admired him and everything. Just this moony idea he's going to run in heaven. What was my notion in reality? Well, there are going to be wheelchairs in heaven. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled. Okay, let's do, let's go back now. Jesus marveled that he found a Gentile over any Jew in faith. The centurion. The disciples are out in the middle of a storm, holding their bilge pump cans. There's no wind, and, and, the, and the water is like a sea of glass. What just happened here? James, you were all wet. Well, it was, it right, yeah, it was raining, wasn't it? All the way, what, what's good? Okay. Now the multitude is like, did you just see that man, that pulsing man that was in bed? And they probably knew who he was. If he came from Nazareth. And they would know that that man was sincere, that he was not faking. And that guy just walked by me holding his bed. What just happened here? Now, this is the same Jesus that grew up in that town. He got all the A's. He was the perfect child. Because they didn't believe him. And you think, well, give me signs and wonders of the charismatic movement. It's, okay, yeah, they still don't believe all these marvels and all these signs and wonders and healings and everything that goes on for three for three and a half years. And when it comes to the trial of Jesus, the nation cries out in disbelief. Crucify him. We'll take Barabbas. And you get foolish people that come up to me, well, if you just show me Jesus, I'll believe I'll show you the I'll show you the wilderness journey how they saw God. Every single day in the wilderness, forty days and forty nights, they saw that cloudy pillar. They saw that fiery pillar. It did not go away. It did not dissipate. It did not disappear. That's seeing God, and they still reject it. The ha the the the. the, the Oh, Reuben, 
Gad, I think it was, and the half tribe of Manasseh, after all that do say, we don't want to go to the promised land. We'll take this land right here. How many times did they cry, oh God, can you give us water? God, can you give us food? We're sick of this manna. They marveled and glorified God. Well, that's what you, what you are supposed to do. You are supposed to do things what God tells you to do. And it won't be miracles. You are to represent God as a Christian. You are to preach the gospel. You are trying to live a holy life. You are to love the brethren, love your enemies, and in that return, they are not to love and glorify you. They're to glorify God. Which has given such power unto men. They missed the point. Men, there's only one true man in that whole group. And he grew up in their area, he grew up in their homes, and, he, and they missed him. <clears throat> and as Jesus passed through events, he saw a man named Matthew. All right, there's Matthew of the, of the Gospel of Matthew. Look how late Matthew comes into the picture. Matthew wasn't there for the Sermon on the Mount. Where did Matthew get the Sermon on the Mount? Well, you know, they all sat together. And, no, the Holy Spirit. Moses wasn't there for Abraham and all, and he wrote. Where did he get that from? The Holy Spirit. Sitting at the receipt of customs, what was he? He was a tax collector. Custom, you know what customs are. When you get off the airplane, you've got to come over to this person or group of people, this office, and you got to say, well, when I was over here in this country, I bought this. And they would look at it, they would value it, and you would have to pay a tax. To bring it in. That's what it is. Custom. It's a tax. And he said unto him, Follow me. Jesus speaking. And he arose to follow him. <laughs> no ifs, ands, or buts. Hey guys, how many other tax collectors were there there? Was he the only one? We always think, you know, he's the only one. I doubt it, but Matthew had to be somebody in God's eyes because this is Matthew's gospel. They say that Matthew would have picked up his pencil, which he had, and paper, and start writing. Or taking notes. At what point he starts writing taking notes, we don't know. But he shows up in chapter 9. You read how much happened before him? Matthew would have to be educated enough to write, do facts and figures, and no values of commodities for people to pay their taxes. And the occupation of Matthew, not Matthew himself, but we don't know. Because after all, Judas was a thief and the uh, treasurer. They, the, the, the receipt of customs, they were not completely all honest, honest people. They would overcharge the people and guess where the extra money would go. And it came to pass at 
as Jesus sat at me in the house. Later on, we're going to realize in the gospel, Matthew gets up, called by Jesus, and Matthew says, come home with me and let's have a meal. But who's writing it? Matthew's writing. So he said, come to pass, Jesus said at me in the house. What house? My house. Matthew doesn't write what the other gospels write. Matthew invited him into his house. Matthew doesn't say, hey, well, I invited him in the house, my house. Behold, many publicans and sinners, this is the scum of the people. You'll learn that in a moment. Came and sat down with him and his disciples. There's a lot of people you don't want to be associated with if you're religious. So in other words, if the city of Daytona Beach were to have a, a gula and the mayor and all that, and he, was sitting at and he would see me sitting at that table, isn't that the guy that yells and screams? <laughs> yeah. I forget what the name of the Catholic Church here is. But he was at his school. He looked at it. Isn't that the guy that tried to pass those papers in front of my church? Yes. Then what's he doing here? If there was a Southern Baptist gulag, isn't that the guy at King James only? Yeah. What's he doing here? Everything I taught in my church, another pre he rebuked the people and rebuked me. What's he doing here? He's not one of our elite. He's not a priest. He's not a Levite. came and sat down with him and his disciples. So Jesus is eating with a group of people. They're not the, the, It's them people. I grew up with those people. Them people. And when the Pharisees saw it, uh-oh, those are the... Now remember, Paul was a Pharisee. And you got to ask yourself, when they mention the Pharisee, is Paul there? Because one of the things to be an apostle is you have to be with the life of Jesus in his ministry. And Paul was official, dedicated by God, an apostle. Paul would have witnessed the, the life and ministry of, of Jesus, not as a disciple, but as a Pharisee. But he was baptized by the baptism of John. He saw the resurrected Christ, and maybe he's, every time you see Pharisee, maybe Paul was there. And when the Pharisee saw it, they said unto his disciple, they're not going to say it to Jesus. I've been in the public ministry many years, and my children would be there, and my daughter's younger than me. They go up to my daughter. What's he doing? You, need, you don't need to listen to your dad. Your dad's a fool. Dad would hear what's being said. Dad would walk over. I gotta go. I gotta go. See you. <laughs> Bye. Why eateth your master with publicans and say, Ew, with those people. But when Jesus heard that, <laughs> uh oh, he said unto them, the Pharisees, 
They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. You know, the Pharisees were the, they were the elite. They were the cleanest. They were, you know, they did everything that was right. Mark that down that they, they died and went to hell. That did not believe on Jesus. And you got these other people sitting here having meat with Jesus. Well, they're sinners. They, they lie. They steal. They adultery and everything like that. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and sacrifice. But I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What the, what the Pharisees are saying is, ew, those trashy people, what's he doing with them? He's not like us. And the Pharisees were proper living right without God. The Pharisees showed no mercy to anybody. Jesus showed mercy. The, the Pharisees brought every sacrifice. And man, they tied the mint. How many leaves of mint? And they tied. 10%. Can't give God 10.3%. Look what you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Curse be you. You went one footstep over the Sabbath journey. You know, it gets me a lot of times. Like they were in the cornfields and, and the disciples were rubbing the corn to, to get something to eat. And, hey, you ain't supposed to do that on the Sabbath. What are you guys doing on the Sabbath? Walking with Jesus in the cornfield yourselves. Isn't that a violation? The this, this Pharisees are a righteous group of people. They're too righteous for God. They're too righteous to repent. Many of them. I said Paul was one. But these sinners, these publicans, will come up to God and confess who they are and what they are and seek the mercy of God. Then came... To him, the disciples of John. That's John the Baptist. John had disciples. Now watch them. Why do we, disciples of John, and the Pharisees, lump themselves with the Pharisees? Oh, now we got trouble. That's the wrong group of people. You know, I know Baptist churches... They lump themselves in, you know, every single church you pass by, pray for them. As wrong as the Catholic Church is, and, and the wrongness of their Bible, we will give you their monthly publications on the devotions of the perverted Bible they believe in. The daily mode. I mean, pray. And I know, I know here at Daytona Beach, I know pastors of Baptist churches, and they associate themselves with all the politicians and the, and the upper yup up people of the Daytona 500. And while I and other good people of evangelism are here 
And hopefully Lord, pray for me next day to I want to get out there and preach the gospel. All day long, sweating, getting tracks out, preaching, our voices gone, trying to get the gospel out. They ride around on those little golf carts, giving people a ride in the name of Jesus, and they may get a cookie. That's that's what the first Baptist, that's what the Southern Baptists do for evangelizing. Their way of evangelizing at the Daytona 500, they will they will take a group of people, move them this area to that area, the infield of the track. And that's all for Jesus. Do you witness to them? Do you give? No, we give them a cookie. You don't give them a gout? No, we don't give them a, We give them a bag of cookies. You don't tell them about Jesus? No, 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 because that may we may not be able to do that next year. Well, since the year of COVID-19, they haven't been able to do nothing. And the evangelist Christians of the Bible are still out there preaching. But that didn't cost you nothing. So John's disciples are lumping themselves with the Pharisees. Oh, man. Now, the Pharisees and we, we fast. But thy disciples fast not. Why is everybody wondering what you don't do. You don't go knocking on doors like we don't go knock on like we go knocking on doors. Well, you know, we in our church we go down the street corner, we hold up signs. You don't do that. I love this thing. We go to church on Sunday morning. You don't go to church Sunday morning. Well, maybe there's not enough people or place in the area you live to go hold signs. <laughs> maybe you, and I wrote this weekend to somebody, maybe you can't get to church on Sunday morning. Even asking your pastor and people in your church and they won't give you a ride. Ah, maybe we don't go knocking on doors. Well, I do other things. May they do something else? We have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. We have it every month. We, you know, big deal. There's always somebody who's going to look at you and say, you don't do People go to me, I'm preaching on the street. I let my light shine. Well, I say, I don't say, well, do you preach on the street? I say, have you told somebody about Jesus? Now, see, I put it in a whole big category of witnessing. Any shape or form that you let people know about you. Well, I let my light shine. How, how does that tell people about Jesus? I've had people say, I know, do you tell people, uh, yeah, I use gospel, gospel tracts like your daughter's doing. Well, hey, my glory of God. Uh, you don't use the gospel tracts. We, oh, come on. As long as they're King James and they're true to the point. Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bridegroom mourn? Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. We're slowly getting to the church. Because you see all the people rejecting him? As long as the bridegroom, Jesus, is with them. Well, there he is, walking, talking, eating. You wonder, how, how much did he get to eat? You ever wonder that? He's over there sitting down having a meal. And look what people you're with. Well, I'll tell you what. They that are holy, not the physician, but they that are sick. How come you don't, how come you guys don't fast like we fast? And he's got to turn around and he's got to answer them. 
He was having a meal. He was on the ship having a nap. And he was woken up. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. Calvary and the inception. He's already now starting to tell them. Then shall they fast after he's dead. After he, because they're not eating up in the upper room. Then after he ascends into heaven, there's a fasting. He's starting to tell them now the death, burial, and resurrection. No man put a new cloth onto an old garment. Now you got the New Testament and the Old Testament. That's what it's about. Don't take the new and stitch up the Old Testament. I know a preacher... Well, you know, in the Old Testament, there were Christians. No, no, no. That, that's Acts. That's Antioch. You're going to tear the pages of your Bible. For that which is put in it, to fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rest is made worse. If you ever tried, if you ever had a hole in your jeans, and you try to get a cloth and sew a new patch into your je old jean, you end up with a rip that's worse. Neither do men put new wine, the New Testament, into the old bottles, the Old Testament. Don't take the new and put it in the old, and don't take the old and put it in the new. The Galatian church tried that, and Paul rebukes them. Well, you know, the people in the Old Testament, they saw Calvary. No, they did not. How on earth could the whole entire nation stand there and, and mock Jesus on the cross if they saw Calvary? Else the bottles break. And the wine runs over. So when you get your, when you don't rightly divide, and you mix your Old Testament with your New Testament, and you mix the Old Testament with the New Testament, you've got leaky bottles that are busted, and they're no good. You will have to do rightly divide after you've studied the scriptures. Now, don't go Paul only. There are 66 books. Don't go 67. Oh, you know, the prayer of Jabez. So we have to write up. I can't believe they wrote a whole book on the prayer of Jabez. And you don't know how many Baptist churches. Did you read the book of Jabez? I said, can you even find Jabez in your Bible? I, I know he's in one of the Chronicles. That's how much I know about Jabez. I could find Jabez. You give me a few moments, I can find Jabez. And he's not in a bookstore. And you'll get these... The, the, uh, Okay, uh, uh, here's New Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. Here's one. <laughs> Come to Kentucky and see the ark of God. Where the measurements don't match the measurements of the Bible. Because in my Genesis commentary, I gave you five different measurements of the Cuban, including their measurements. Well, in Kentucky, we didn't use
boy, my brain. Um, pitch. It's too mis messy. Well, if Kentucky had a great big flood, your ark would be underwater. It has electric emergency exit signs and elevators. Really? And then when I did the thing, when you read the Bible, it says it, it occurs to one window. And they did an essay when a window is not necessarily a window. No one in the New Testament is told to build an ark. The Galatian church went back to the law after salvation, and Paul rebuked them. Nine sixteen, nine seventeen is don't get your doctrine all fouled up. If you don't rightly divide the dispensation, and that's a mean, ugly, nasty word today of all religions and denominations and the non-denominations. Ooh, the mean, nasty denomination. And dispensation. Well, you've got to rightly divide. Adam was not saved like a Christian. There, the specific time of the Gospels were not as the law. Oh, wait a minute. How could you say the Gospels are not the law? Did they have God manifested in the flesh walking around? Tell me in the law the last time a Hebrew, Jewish, Israeli, Judah, man that was leprosy got healed. You have got the got the, you got to rightly divide the scriptures, or your bottles are going to break, and the wine is going to run out. And when you approach Jesus, and you hand him your bottle, and he opens it up, and it's empty, what happened? are broken. 